Welcome everybody to the Anthroposoma University. Um, today's session, we will talk about uh, diamond geology. Our guest speaker is Dr. John Bristow, who is not only a doctor in geology, but he also has a great amount of experience uh, in the field. So I'm sure it will be a very interesting session for you today. And um, John, I would like to pass the floor to you right now. It's all yours. Thanks, Kim. Um, and I really appreciate that introduction. And I appreciate the fact that you've invited me to talk to your summer university and World Diamond Center Diamond Short Course. Um, so my, my name is John Bristow. I'm a, I'm a geologist, um, stroke geochemist. I, I live in South Africa. I've been very fortunate in my career to be involved in all aspects of diamond um, activities, right from exploration through to through to mining, um, through to the evaluation of diamonds, rough diamonds, and how you sell and, and market those rough diamonds. And then I've also had some experience with cutting and polishing, spent time in the Indian factories in, in India, which was fascinating. And so I'm going to take you through the sector today, which is, is, is there's, there's a lot of information in my presentation. And um, I just want to point out that these, these um, 10 points here are the topics that I'm going to to cover um, quite quite briefly, I, I should add. There's also a lot of information in this presentation so that you can come back to the document um, that Kim is going to send to everyone or make available to everyone during the, the, the period of your course. Obviously, you'll have the webinar, but you'll also be able to access the actual presentation and, and use it as a bit of a, a work manual. So we're going to go through an introduction, world uh, production and pricing, uh, formation and setting, kimberlites, lamperites and alluvial deposits. Kimberlites and lamperites are the source rocks that carry diamonds to the Earth's surface. We'll talk a bit about product variability. Something on the history, the lead producers and diamond exploration, the mining and recovery methods, and then some of the conclusions and challenges that the industry faces. Just to point out on the top right hand side there, a, a, a carrot, which is the terminology we use for diamonds, is 0.2 of a gram. And that um, carrot measure came from, from the carob seeds, a, an interesting tree that, that grew in India and now most places around the world. And, and down below, you'll see um, this remarkable structure of diamond, um, the, the covalent bonds, um, which give us this extreme hardness. And bear in mind that our diamond is pure, pure carbon, really. Um, and we have a diamond structure on the left. And of course, graphite on, on the right hand side is still carbon, but very different to the hard minerals that we deal with. Looking at world production, um, these two sets of, of um, vertical columns show you diamond production in 2019 and diamond production in 2020. And you'll see there the world's biggest producer is, is Russia, um, in particular a company called El Rosa. If you look at across it on the top right hand side, you'll see the major companies that mine and produce rough diamonds and bear in mind i'm talking about rough diamonds not polished goods so the biggest producer russia 43 million carats in 2019 notice the big drop off during the COVID pandemic in 2020 down to 31 million million carats botswana the second biggest producer 23 million carats last year only 16.9 million million carat, million carats this year and down the bottom, we'll see last year 142 million carats. This year, or not th this year, 220. My apologies, 107 million carats. So we saw a drop of 25% in world production um, last year, uh, mostly due to COVID. The other point, just to bear in mind, is that Australia, it's it's Argyle Diamond Mine in the northwest. Um, of Australia up in what they call the Kimberley block has now closed. It closed at the end of last year. So we will be taking a further 10, 11 million carats of diamonds out of world production in, in this year. So, so the diamond, um, rough diamond production is certainly falling off and it's, it's an important point to be considered. And that's why we need young geologists to get out there and go and explore for, for diamond deposits, new diamond deposits. And an interesting point to also take note of is that if you look at those two red circles in the middle of the, of the slide, you'll see Russia's average dollar per carat from its 31 million 
um, carats of production is only $73 per carat compared to Botswana, which is almost double that. And we'll see later, Botswana has a, an amazing diamond mine called Joning, which produces some of the world's um, top quality goods. Um, and we'll see some of those big stones. And then there, there's lots of other stats on that diagram, um, in, including the fact that if you look at typical um, Kimberlite product mix, um, not, about 98% of all the world's diamonds are produced from Kimberlites and, and some lamprites. And alluvial deposits probably make up about 2%. But even in the Kimberlite production, there's industrial goods, very, very poor quality. They're, they're, they're what we call the Indian goods, um, which make up about 50% of the production. Those are the small diamonds, that the Indian cutting, cutting and polishing factories cut very successfully. And then there's the gemstone content, which makes up about 20%, the real, real value. And, and you'll see there 20% of the yield actually gives you about 80% of the overall value. Okay, just another important point going forward, particularly from a geological point of view and project evaluation, is that no two diamonds, rough diamonds are the same. And, and there's no daily measure or benchmark or pricing for rough diamonds. I can't go and look up the price of rough diamonds. So if I, if I discover a Kimberlite, and want to work out its um, it, its value or its NPV or, or model it to see if it could be economic. But I have to understand um, how I come to a value for the the rough goods that come out of that that project. And so we have a concept in in this whole Kimberlite um, business, Kimberlite lamprite or alluvial deposits of run of mine. So so we always look to to find or, or, or recover a large volume, particularly say 10,000 carats, and to determine a run of mine price, an average price for all of those goods. And, and the point um, that I'm trying to make here is that, you know, valuing rough goods is, is, is challenging. You'll, you'll do it in the course, but it's very important to be able to um, come up with enough rough diamonds in, in my, my profession whereby we can come up with a, a general average value for, for diamonds that we'll get out of a Kimberlite. And that may involve a great range from good gemstone diamonds to, to very poor quality industrial diamonds. On the right hand side, just for interest in that blue box, you'll see that then when we come to, to polished goods, even in the case of polished goods, given the variability, we, we can have one stone, if we took a, take a one carat um, excellent cut VS2, good, and you'll learn about all of those um, categories later in your course. You can see there's, there's a D color stone on the left hand side, which um, last year was running at about $8,200 a carat. But down to the M, the poor quality, sort of going yellow and, and brown, that diamond is only um, at 3,061 carats, so $3,061 per carat. So, so tremendous variability in this, um, the product that, that we mine and, and sell to, to ladies out there. Okay, let's get to the important stuff. Um, the, the, most of the world's diamonds are produced in kimberlites or from kimberlites. Um, those kimberlites are typically found in old crustal areas of the world, what we call cratons. So if you look at the, the, the sort of um, point where I've got my arrow, you'll see this, this, is a, this is a diagram on the left that gives you a cross section of what most of the, the, um, the major continents um, of our earth look like. They typically have old portions, what we refer to as cratons. Down here in South Africa, we call it the Carpal Craton, which comprises crust and then, then a deep mantle lithosphere. And diamonds, diamonds to form, um, they form at depths or pressures of greater than 50 kilobars, which equates to about 150 kilometers down below us. And so we, we have in this diagram the graphite diamond stability field. We think they're pods and patches of diamonds um, that sit down in these, these deep ancient parts of the world. Um, you, you'll see here on, on the left, the rift zone. So that's where, like the East African rift, the, the continents get stretched. On the other side, we have mobile belts where there's sort of accretion to the continents. And, and the Kimberlites, 
the lamprite, you'll see there K is a kimberlite, L is a lamprite, so, and we'll talk about those shortly. O is an orangeite, or what we call group two kimberlites. The kimberlites are no more than passenger trains that come from great depth, and in, in route to the surface, they will typically um, pick up um, diamonds if they go through the right train station and bring those diamonds to surface, and that's where we look to mine the diamonds. Um, the, the point also to make here is that this whole sampling of the mantle, um, kimberlites are very small and they don't really cover much area as they were moving through through the craton. Um, they, that process is very inefficient. So, so you'll see later in terms of stats that we know about 8,000 kimberlites and lamprites and similar rocks that um, carry or could carry diamonds, but only about 1% of those have actually carry, carried diamonds to the surface. So statistically, um, finding diamond, diamond mines is, is very challenging. On the right-hand side is just a cross-section of the joining kimberlite this open pit um, here, you can see the, the plant, it's a big plant, but obviously this open pit is about 600 meters and very big. And that kimberlite comprises three, three intrusions, um, the K1, K2, K3. And if you look at the top right hand corner, you'll see how those pipes actually look. They look like carrots um, that extend down to depth. And we're going to look at some more of that as we go along. Um, so, so in that previous slide, we were looking here at what we call primary sources um, of, of diamonds, the kimberlites and the lamprites and the orangeites. Um, and then many of these cryptonic areas, old parts of the continents have been weathered off. So if we go to this diagram, we're now looking at typical alluvial settings. So, so you can imagine in the left-hand block here, you, ha you had an ancient continent, you had a number of kimberlites here in South Africa. We have a range of kimberlite ages from the, the famous Cullinan mine at Premier, 1200 million years. Phoenicia, which is now South Africa's flagship mine of De Beers, um, about 500 million years. The younger Joining, two, 240. Um, and then typically the kimberlite mines around Kimberley, the famous Kimberley mines are about 80 million years. Those pipes have been weathered down and the diamonds that are released um, are then typically washed, blown and transported down ancient rivers. And this applies to places like Angola, West Africa, Russia, we see it, even Brazil. And, and here in South Africa, um, we, we then mine alluvial terraces. The, the old rivers, of course, move around. They leave gravel behind them. And we have alluvial terraces. So in the top right-hand corner, you see an alluvial mining operation, which is not far out of Kimberley. It's about 100 kilometers west of Kimberley. And down in the Atlantic Ocean, we have the world's biggest diamond placer, where we mine diamonds both from ancient raised beaches, which are now mostly mined out, and we also mine diamonds from drowned beaches. And we'll, we'll get to that a bit later on with either small boats or, or very big, um, De Be big um, mining vessels as De Beers Marine do. So that's just a snapshot of, of the sort of um, setting of both primary deposits and the alluvial or secondary deposits. Let's go and look now at um, where these where, where these rocks and 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 diamond diamondiferous rocks occur. And if you look at this map of the globe, which has been stretched out, you'll see most of the major continents um, have um, have many kimberlites, lots of kimberlites, a whole lot of lamprites as well, um, and then other other rocks, rarer rocks, which can also bring diamonds to the surface. So, so these these are mostly in on, on this diagram, um, kim, show kimberlites, lamprites, and alluvial placer deposits. Um, for example, here on on the west coast of South Africa, you'll see these blue blue blocks and it says Orange River, Namaquiland and so on. Those are the alluvial deposits of, of the west, southwest part of South Africa and Namibia. The red dots in the diagram are, are the typical kimberlites. And we see that picture again in, in Australia. Um, we see red, lots of red dots up here in Russia. So there's two major areas of diamond production in Russia, which is in Siberia or Yakutsk on, on, the, on the eastern side. And then there's the diamonds that are produced at Archangel across in the 
on, on the west side of Russia. So, so that picture is very busy. Very interestingly, if we now go to look at actual diamond mines, you'll see straight away there's a huge difference in terms of the number of um, red dots and, and a couple of blue ones um, left on, on this diagram. So, so, and that goes back to the statistics I, I mentioned that many, many um, kimberlites, lamprites, and alluvial deposits. Um, if you exclude the alluvial deposits, we know about eight of about 8,000 actual intrusions. But when we get to, to actual mines that have been economically sustainable, it's a very different picture. And, and I'll come back to those stats lately. And just to reinforce here that Argyle Diamond Mine with the red ring about it, around it is not closed. Okay, let's go and look at um, these fascinating um, primary rocks, kimberlites and lamprites. Again, the slides are busy. I'm not going to go through all of it. But kimberlites are, are derived from great depth. Um, probably some of them come from as much as two, 300 kilometers down below the surface of the earth. And they are a very un un unusual mixed up group of ultramafic rocks, what we call ultramafic rocks, dominated by olivine and phlogopite, macrocrysts and phenocrysts. I'll show you pictures so shortly. And, and they have other minerals like, um, sorry, darkside, ilmenite, and garnet in, in, in that whole rock structure. And, and we in South Africa recognize two groups down the bottom, type one, Montechillite kimberlites. Those are the classic kimberlites that we find around Kimberley or the Phoenicia diamond mine. And then type two, which are um, phlogopipe rich um, orangeites or, or type two kimberlites. On the right hand side are, are a brief description of lamproites. They are very um, ultra potassic. Um, they have lots of, of alkali uh, minerals and elements. And they're somewhat different to the kimberlites that, that um, or, or most of our kimberlites and the classic sort of sites for these rocks are, are West Australia. And we're going to look at some of that again here. There's different types. So there's the olive, olivine bearing rocks or on, or on, or orangeites. And then there's lucite bearing rocks and, and phlogopite bearing groups as well. So, so quite a variety of, of different rock types in there. Let's focus on the kimberlites. This is the, the typical classic model of a kimberlite pipe that we um, find here in South Africa and, and for which there's a, a great deal of, of information. Um, this whole field of diamond geology is probably one of the most well-researched and published in the world. And so there's no shortage of information for those of you who wish to, to gather more. So classic um, kimberlite model, as I said, it looks like a, a, a carrot um, up at the surface here in, in the very well-preserved uneroded kimberlites like Arapa and Botswana. You, you have, have old lake deposits. These would also, or these structures are actually very similar to the Mar deposits, M-A-R-R, that you find in, in Germany from small alkaline volcano, uh, alkaline intrusion. So, so typically um, you have this carrot-like structure, if it's well-preserved, a, a crater at the top, a, a big sort of central part of the body, which we call the diatreme, and then you get into the root zone, and then below the root zone, you, you get into the original fissure feeders, and it's these feeders and fissures that probably went um, sort of in various ways down into the mantle and carried up diamonds. And in South Africa, we we have, um, well, not South African Botswana, you have an example of where craters be mined, slid a rapa, so a very uneroded pipe. Most of the kimberlites in South Africa were, were in the diatreme in this um, middle of the pipe. And then we, sorry, we also have fisher mines in South Africa. Um, one of them at the moment, Helen Mine, near Swartrugans north of Johannesburg, has been redeveloped as a, a small fisher mine. Um, and there, there on the right hand bottom is a classic example of the premier kimberlite. You can see it's a very mixed up brecciated rock um, with lots of lots of olivine um, um, crystals, which will be the small dark pieces in here. And then these are these other light and dark pieces are country rock fragments. Um, these are just pictures of um, apologies, uh, pictures of different kimberlites. There's the Letzing satellite pipe uh, produces these exceptional big um, white diamonds in the Sutu. Um, he has, he has um, the, the Phoenicia diatreme um, in the northern part of South Africa, De Beers' flagship mine. 
and across on the right hand side is a cross section and a, and a plan view of the famous Cullinan or Premier Diamond Mine where the, the Cullinan Diamond 3106 carats came from back in the 1900s. Um, so th those are sort of classic examples. The other thing to bear in mind is that these are just effectively old ancient volcanoes and volcanoes, as you know, grow in stages. They don't all happen at one time. So you can see different different intrusions. They, they consist of multiple multiple intrusions um, of, of slightly different ages um, that build these ancient volcanic features. This is what they look like in thin section. Um, we geologists um, cut thin sections or, or, or very thin slides of these rocks. We polish them down and we look at them through high power mi microscopes. And you can see the different minerals that make up these, these fascinating rocks. So, so there on the left-hand side are, are pieces of kimberlite from the Vesselton mine in Kimberley. And on the right hand side is the, the Letseng pipe, um, again, pictures of the different minerals. Let's then, by comparison, go and look at the, the West Australian lamprites. Um, these are, are the, the, the lamprites um, of, of West Australia, um, the famous Argyle diamond mine just recently closed. And look at that, 1,107 million years old. And on the left hand side are the Ellendale lamprites, um, which are only 20 million years old. So it's a very different. Um, Argyle has been super diamondiferous, very poor quality diamonds. The Ellendale pipes, two of them, four and nine, people are looking to redevelop them and they, their grades and economics have been much more challenging. And on the right hand side there is, is the classic cross section of a lamprite pl plug. They look somewhat different to kimberlites and that they typically have this very sort of flared, um, almost champagne glass type structure. Um, and that's one of the, the main distinctions other than the actual mineralogy of, of a lamprite pipe. There, there again on the left hand side is, is a section of the Ellendale 4 pipe. This is a, a 20 million year old pipe. It's a composite volcano. Um, it, again, you'll see in the, in the cross sections below, very flared basin-like structure, champagne glass-like structure, and then going down into, into the root zone, which obviously goes to depth because it had diamonds carried up to, to the surface. And in the pictures on the right-hand side, again, thin sections, those thin, thin sections are probably have a field of view of about five millimeters, and you can see the different minerals in there. And, and the white minerals on the top right-hand side or, or P is, a, is an olivine phenocris, and then at the top left there, um, there's, there's an, a, um, an olivine macrocris. And down below, you can see lots of um, nice orange tetra ferry flogger pipe for, for those that are interested. Okay, um, there, there's a fascinating Prairie Creek lamprite in Arkansas in the USA. It's actually a national park. Um, you can't mine it, but people regularly go and dig there and find diamonds, and then they can carry the diamonds away with them. And, and again, you can see the very flared structure. There's a piece of the rock from, from Prairie Creek, and you can see these sort of orange yellow um, pieces here are big olivines, the olivine macrocris sit in a very dark matrix. Interestingly, in 2004, um, Rio Tinto found a lamprite or a series of small lamprites in India, northern India, known as the Bunda lamprites, and they they are shown in this right hand slide. Um, that 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 big one B B28 down there at the bottom probably should be a mine, but I think unfortunately the Indian bureaucracy is probably going to make it very difficult to actually get out and eventually mine this this um, lamprite in India. Okay, lamprites and thin section, they, they look broadly similar to kimberlites, except um, because of the, the very high amount of potassium and, and the differences in the magma, um, the magmas tend to be a bit more, I guess, corrosive. Um, and you'll see, for example, on the left-hand slide there, the way, sorry, those, those olivines, big olivines, have actually been attacked around the edges or resorbed. Um, so that, that top left-hand slide, quite unusual, and the bottom left-hand slide would look very much similar to our Group 2 kimberlites, orangeites in South Africa. And then on the right-hand side, still the same rocks, but we're now looking down into the matrix with higher magnification, and we can see lots of the very fine flogger parts showing up.
that that um, sort of orange brown coloration. Okay, um, so so that, that those are the rocks. Those are the rocks that we we look for if we go exploring um, to look for new diamond deposits, primary deposits. We look to to recover um, or, or discover kimberlites and and lamproites. Um, the majority of the world's diamonds come out of kimberlites, but there are important lamproites, for example, as we we had in Argyle. If, if we go to diamonds themselves, they, they are fascinating minerals. Um, we, we are quite confident that most of the work that we, we have done shows that diamonds form down in, in the deep mantle, deeper than 50 or, or deeper than 150 kilometers. And they're actually what we in geological term call xenocris. So they are, are chunks of diamond or layers of diamonds, very, very irregularly dispersed. Um, down in the in the deep mantle we've also been able to date diamonds um de beers and other companies have over the years contributed um diamonds with mostly with inclusions um, we date the inclusions sort of encapsulated in the diamonds and we've managed to establish that hartsburgitic hartsburgitic diamonds or diamonds that come out of um, what we call hartsburgitic peridotites are extremely old, some of them almost as old as, as the Earth itself. The Earth is about 4.5 billion years old, and we found diamonds from sort of 3.5 to 2 billion, which we ascribe to being Hasbergitic um, type perigenesis. Sorry about the technology. We then have this green line here. Again, we green line, we find what we call lozolitic diamonds which um, again sort of go hand in hand with the with the Hasbergitic, they too are old. And then very interestingly, we, we get eclogitic diamonds, this red line, which um, are somewhat different and they, they um, can be very young. So they show a quite regular spectrum of, of young ages. And, and again, based on the work we've done, we've also done um, carbon isotopes on these diamonds we we we're fairly confident that the the the, the peridotitic the p-type um the, the 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 purple ones hasbergitic and then again the green ones have formed in deep in the deep ancient mantle probably from degassing of of mineral or not minerals or, or substances like methane and in that um, deep mantle reducing environment you can convert at pressure and temperature that methane to 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 diamond on the other hand, these eclogitic diamonds, which show sort of repeated quite regular ages, we think probably occur due to um, eclogitic or, or eclogitic processes or processes of subduction. So these ancient continents, as we know, um, either have an old um, core at, at the base, or we are adding to that core with younger geologic processes through processes of subduction. And, and those diamonds, um, these eclogitic diamonds, which also have different carbon isotopic signatures, appear to be related to subduction events where we're recycling old biogenic um, carbonates back into the mantle and taking them down to depth where diamonds form. Diamonds themselves are fascinating. Uh, when you get into high pressure microscopy, microscopy and, and, and a process we call thermoluminescence. So these pictures of diamonds have the, the actual slices, they um, sort of micron scale slices of diamonds taken <clears throat> through, through, the, through, the, through the actual diamond, cut through the diamond typically with a laser and you'll see very distinct growth features. And many diamonds, natural diamonds and, and synthetic diamonds typically show growth from, from an ancient nucleus, very often just a little seed of diamond like we see here in the blue one on the top right hand side and again below <clears throat> in this diamond on the right bottom side. So, so they're little seeds and then the diamond nucleates around that and grows. And there's been some, some really good um, research done on, on diamond formation and how this process actually works. Right, and then um, the other important thing about diamonds, and, and, and it's something you're going to see in, in your course, is that um, many diamonds, even good quality diamonds, have very small inclusions. 
And in this diamond left-hand side here, diamond inclusions, you'll see there's a, under, under the surface, there's a sulfide inclusion. Many, many diamonds or black diamonds are made up or, or contain lots of sulfide, hence the dark color. On, oh, sorry, this is annoying. On, on the right top-hand side is a peridic, peridotitic garnet. See that bright red garnet sitting in the middle of that diamond? Um, and that's, that's a pyropic or peridotitic um, inclusion. And then down below on the right-hand side is a purple inclusion. And they probably, you know, on a, on a, they, they're a couple of um, fractions of a millimeter. Probably, um, you know, point, point 0.2 of a millimeter. Some of these, some of them can be, get bigger, but those inclusions are also quite useful because they are the inclusions that we can use to date diamonds. And um, previously, in the early years, and that was probably about 20 years ago, we dated um, diamonds by breaking out the inclusions, which is not very efficient. Um, more recently, with the technology, of the, the way it's moving, and again with lasers, we use um, what we call ICP laser analytical um, facilities, and we're able to drill a hole with the laser into, into those inclusions and, and actually date them. Um, typically these days, um, either with, um, ar not argon argon, would, it would be um, neodymium samarium or, or lead dating. So there are various radiogenic techniques that we can use to date these diamonds. And the ages I showed you in the previous slide are from those sort of studies. Okay, and, and, and that, that moves me then to, to the next point and the important point about um, the fact that there are diamonds and diamonds and, and no two diamonds are the, are the same. So we're now getting into the realm of, you know, we go exploring, we look for, for, for diamondiferous kimberlites, or <coughs> we may even, excuse me, look at, um, at alluvial deposits. And so the next few slides will just give you a, an overview of how variable diamonds actually are. So if we start on the bottom left-hand side of this diagram, you'll see there diamonds, and these are what we call run of mine. These are parcels of diamonds coming out of these, these deposits. And it's the sort of stuff that geologists get excited about because if we can get parcels of diamonds like that, we can start telling something about the, the a, obviously the quality of the diamonds and the, and the grade of, of diamond deposits. So bottom left-hand side is the famous Mabuji Mai um locality it's it's um it's interestingly kimberlitic material but it's been sort of smeared and 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 stretched over the top by quite extensive erosion and and so you sort of have a an overprint of, a, of an alluvial deposit sitting on top of of um of kimberlite so mujibaya um, Zaire before russia and botswana used to be the the world's largest producer of, of diamonds, Zaire or Democratic Republic of Congo, but but very interestingly, the run of mine value there is only about eighteen dollars a carat, and it varies sort of around that. So so lots and lots of diamonds, and they're still being mined, um, mostly from alluvial type um, artisanal mining, eighteen dollars a carat. Then if you look in the middle here on the top right, we go to, to Marangi. This is in southeast Zimbabwe. It's actually an alluvial type setting. It, it's a very old deposit. It has an age of about a thousand, a billion, billion years, thousand million years. And again, it's really, um, really very poor quality diamonds. So, so top right hand corner is the picture of sort of typical run of mine. In the middle here, we have um, the parcel that's been cleaned in acid and sorted or, or sieved, and, and it's mostly eight grainers. And, and these, these diamonds in general, their run of mine value is about $35 to $50 a carat. And, and most of these diamonds, because they sat in very old, um, a, a very old sedimentary environment in the Mkondo belt in Southeast Zimbabwe, they were, they were damaged by radioactive solutions um, migrating through through the conglomerates and the rocks they were sitting in and and those diamonds are like that and uh, like that they rounded they, they have a, a coating um, and they're typically very black and they don't look too exciting and it's all due to radio radiation damage over that a thousand million years um, you do get some some better quality stones as we see there in the middle after they've been cleaned 
but even there, if you if you cut and polish them and then go and look at them under a microscope, you very often find that they're still damaged down through the internal structure of the actual diamond down the crystallographic um, axes. And so those diamonds, not all, or they don't always give you the real color and the luster that they should because of that inherent damage that they've suffered. <clears throat> On the other hand, if we move to Argyle, obviously it's been an iconic mine at, at its peak. It produced um, back in the 90s, um, about 25% of the world's production came from one mine. So, so that mine at its peak was producing something like 42 million carats per annum in, in a total production back then of about 160 million carats. But again, very, very poor quality um, run of mine there, nine dollars a carat. Um, but but the, the 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 reason that mine worked is that the grade, the carats per hundred tons, was exceptional. So there there's the grade. So that that diamond mine was producing at its in its early days seven carats a ton of of diamond, which is equates to seven hundred carats per 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 hundred tons. Which is exceptional. Most most of the world's mines, like Phoenicia and Joining today, are somewhere around a, a carat or you know carat and a half um, per per hundred tons. Um, and um, some of the some of the Canadian mines, Akati and Divik, have also been quite rich. But but the 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 overriding um, product from from Argyle was was generally poor. But again, they did have these exceptional pink and, and red and purple diamonds, which I think um, anyone in the business has probably heard about. The, these cut and polish stones, never never really big, mostly below two carats in the cut and polish, um, are now selling or have been selling for like something between one and three million dollars per carat. So 0.2 of a gram, a fifth of a gram is selling for a million or, or three million dollars. And those diamonds, given the scarcity and given that the mine is now closed, are only going to um, become more valuable over, over time, given that that scarcity or rarity. Um, that's just pictures of the mine. There's there's a major um, rehabilitation program underway with local communities, and it'll be interesting to see what this, uh, as I say, once iconic mine looks like once it's rehabilitated. And and there, just a picture of Australia um, up in the far northwest territories, what we know as the Kimberley Block. Okay, let, let's move on then to, you know, what us geologists and I think even the, the purists in the business would consider to be real diamonds. So if we go to Letzing mine diamonds in the Sutu, this is a little, a little um, country in the middle of, of South Africa, you have this amazing diamond mine called, called Letzing. Um, and they produce these exceptional um, white stones, um, what we call type 2As. And they also produce um, quite quite rare pinks, uh, pinks rather than reds that you that you saw at Argyle. But but if you look there, you can see um, this this for example the 910 carat diamond bottom right there. The sale price of that in the rough was was 40 million dollars, um, which equates to 44 thousand dollars per carat. And remember in the previous slides at places like Argyle, we were looking at at nine dollars a carat. Um, the pinks too, um, that 13 carats on the left, um, lower side, $8.8 .8 million in the rough, $661,664 per carat. Just, just exceptional stone because of their, their absolute purity and, and the cleanliness or the, the cleanness of the cleanness of the growth. And, and, and we have another one um, at Cullinan Mine. This is north of Johannesburg near, near Pretoria. Cullinan too, famous for its 3,106-carat um, Cullinan diamond, most of which sits in the crown jewels in the UK. But um, Cullinan Mine is famous for its top quality white stones. And again, you'll see the exceptional prices, for example, on the right-hand side of, of white stones. And it also produces some exceptional blue stones as well, very rare. Um, the, the, these, these on the right are what we call type 2A, the blue stones which contain boron, hence the blue color. Um, but again, very scarce. And this stone here, 20 carats fetched um, a price in the rough of $15 million. And you can see there the average dollar per carat price is 747 per carat. 
747,000 per carat. Okay, then, then, then let's just move on to alluvial goods. Now, now um, alluvial goods are effectively coming from the secondary deposits, um, in other words, downstream of the kimberlites. The kimberlites have now been, been weathered off um, through, in the case of Cullinan mine, you know, 1,200 million years. In the case of the Kimberley mines, about 80 million years. And, and, and these diamonds get carried down our big rivers here in South Africa to the West Coast. In that process, um, the, the poor quality, the, 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 what I refer to as the Indian goods and, and the industrial goods of the boards get um, milled and attritioned and broken down. And they almost sort of disappear from, from the system and you end up left with the, with the high quality gems. And so on, on the left-hand side, there is, is typical alluvial production from one of our mines. This was a mine that I was involved with, so I can vouch for these goods. Um, just north of Kimberley, a, a fascinating alluvial deposit um, known as Holpon Clipton, and, the, and these exceptional stones, also very large. And then on the right-hand side, um, the big stones never travel all the way to the ocean, sort of, you know, 1,000 kilometers down the river to, to our west coast. It's the small ones that will typically make it all the way to the coast. But this on the right-hand side is production. It's again run a mine from the Alex core deposit in, on our west coast. And again, here, the average dollar price was probably about $600 a carat. Um, the stone size about half a dot, half a carat per stone, and exceptionally clean goods, um, re really high quality um, commercial whites and makeable goods, which you'll learn about in the course. This is just a slide, and I won't dwell on it, which just shows average kimberlite diamond size, size worldwide about 0.3 carats. Our, our alluvial production in this country averages probably half a carat and, and bigger, half a carat to two carat. And, and, and here is a whole lot of data that's been plotted and it shows this very distinct um, size difference between kimberlitic or primary deposit diamonds and the alluvial deposits. Okay, let's go quickly look at, um, look at some, some history of, of the diamond, um, diamond business. This, this whole business started in India um, and it's about 2000 years old. Um, that's how far back we were seeing diamond production out of India, mostly from the famous Krishna River, very much or setting very similar to what we see on, on the Orange River in South Africa. Lots of big diamonds, lots of exceptional diamonds. And most of these diamonds in the list here are, are famous and all have an amazing history. So, so there's, a, there's a, just a simple map of India. Panar is a little lamprite mine that's still being mined, mostly artisanally or sort of pick and shovel and produces um, some fairly decent gems. But most of the famous <clears throat> diamonds that have come out of India were, were down here on what we, we called Krishna, so the big Krishna River. And at Hyderabad was the, the, the famous Golconda Fort, which was one of the early trading houses for diamonds in, in, in sort of the central part of, of India. Um, India today, and, and I think most people will be aware, and you'll certainly, I think, um, you know, learn more about this, is that India um, purchases, cuts and polishes, manufactures, and then resells about 95% of the world's diamond production. So, so all of that sort of 120 million carats in 2019 or, or 107 million carats in 2020 ends up, most of it ends up in India at, in, in these amazing factories, um, which are becoming more and more, more mechanized. Um, Surat in, in the Northwest part of India has up until now been sort of the main center of activity. Um, at, at its peak, it had about 700,000 employees. I think that has certainly dropped off during the pandemic, but I suspect is, is growing again. And, and one of the reasons India has been so successful is that they have these remarkable artisans or, or you know, people who just specialize in family businesses, cutting and polishing. And, and looking at, at the, the facts and figures in India, they will cut a, a typical sort of one carat stone for $10 a carat. That might be about $70 in Belgium and here in South Africa, you know, we, we do it for $120 a carat and, and you just can't compete for most part against 
against the Indian industry when it comes to cutting and polishing goods. We're also seeing a great deal of technology um, in, in the whole business now. Um, image analysis, you can take a big diamond, put it in a, in a very fancy microscope and construct a 3D model and then work out you know, how many big stones or, or smaller stones you want to cut from, from that single diamond. And then you use lasers to, to initially cut out um, the stones that you, you will then finish um, cutting and polishing or, or not so much cutting, but polishing on, on a lap. Um, and, and there's just an example of, of a diamond that's being put through a serene machine image analysis. And then um, you can cut out those one, two, three, four, five, six um, diamonds um, using laser technology. So, so a very sophisticated um, industry is India, very, very um, proficient, very productive. And man, if you want to see people work, um, you know, get yourself across to India one day and see how these these businesses actually actually work to to stay competitive. After India, Brazil became the next um, key producer of diamonds. Um, it, it was mostly small production, mostly, again, from alluvials. And, and again, the hallmark of Brazilian production, uh, which started in about 1725, was, was um, high quality diamonds and a lot of good colored stones. And, and fascinatingly, although, India, although Brazil has many, many kimberlites and in similar rocks, it, it only now has its first commercial diamond mine called Bruna up in, in the northeast part of India, um, here at this point nine. If, if we then um, just a snapshot again, as I said, many famous large diamonds from alluvial deposits um, and, and some exceptional stones, you see there, you know, seven, 600 carats, 400 carats. Um, and now we have their, their first diamond mine, Bruno, and you'll see some, some um, typical um, um, diamond production left-hand side, more typical sort of mixed colors of, of, a, of a kimberlite, uh, lots of small stuff, some colored stones as, a, for example, the yellow stone. And then um, just across on the right-hand side, some of the historic um, jewelry that's come out of, of Brazil in the past. Fascinating country. Um, but um, hasn't really been a big producer of, of substance. Um, again, just a picture, um, the, the sort of classic areas for diamonds in Brazil was the sort of central eastern state of Minas Gerais, Gerais. Um, and again, famous for alluvial deposits with these exceptional big stones. A lot of those diamonds were initially discovered um, in gold, wash plants, these, um, an example here on the right hand side with peasants or slaves processing gold in, in sluice boxes or wash boxes and they would then start finding these diamonds that, that also were coming out of the alluvial deposits. Okay, if we move on to, to, to South Africa, um, South Africa sort of became the center of the diamond universe. Um, diamonds were discovered in alluvial deposits on the Orange River in 1866, and that led to, to the growth of the industry in South Africa, which obviously also became the home of De Beers. The, these are some of the, the old mines of Kimberley. These are um, Bultfontein and De Toitspan, what they call, the, and they mine through a joint shaft. If you look in the middle of the slide here, you'll see a whole lot of infra infrastructure and, and a shaft. So these two kimberlite pipes, you can see the sort of carrot structure were mined from a, a central shaft and we'll get back to that later. There on the bottom left-hand side is the famous Kimberley big hole, which is um, probably five or eight Ks south of, um, of these two to the joint shaft mine. And again, on the right hand side, you'll see that classic um, example of what kimberlite pipes um, look like. Um, there top left is the famous um, De Beers head office. It doesn't get used much these days. Um, De Beers is now part of Anglo and, and basically operates out of, out of Europe and, and London. Um, but that's the famous Stockdale Street building. Um, and, and there's still, there, there's a wonderful mine museum, it, um, diamond mine museum in Kimberley, where lots of the old buying, buying um, facilities have been recreated. Um, here on, on the left-hand side is a, 
what we call, sorry, a rotary pan. It's still um, technology that we use today in South Africa. It's a bit more sophisticated. It's just a simple washing machine which separates heavy material. Diamonds have a specific gravity of 3.5, separates um, diamonds from, from the light material that they found on. And, and on the right bottom side is a baby shaker that was a, a, a sort of old sieve um, shaker for separating again and concentrating heavy material from from right from the light material okay and then let's move up um, to the cold climates we now have into russia russia as we saw in the early slides is the world's biggest diamond producer in, in two areas one is across in, in yakutia in the northeast of Russia, and the other is Archangel. And, and Russia, Russia has lots of, of gen well, generally smaller um, diamond mines, and all all in the in the Arctic Circle. So you know, the, the, the top right there is the Moni Diamond Mine. It was a super rich mine, one of the very early discoveries. Um, interestingly, those discoveries were made by a, a woman, a lady who was out there as a field geologist with an assistant um, and found these these kimberlite deposits um, the, the 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 stuff for the the localities mines across in in archangelsk in, in the northwest of russia are much more recent discoveries but but a fascinating country and and we see here um, diamond mines being developed and and operated in temperatures that are typically minus 20 to minus 40 degrees particularly in the winter so things freeze um, this is this is the Ula Chinaya mine. This has been one of their biggest open pits, and this is just a, a series of pictures of the Ula Chinaya complex. You can see the the plant on the top right hand side. The cost of mining in in Russia is is about probably five to to six times what it would be down in South Africa and Botswana because as you'll see from these buildings this is the plant but everything has to be cleared to stop things from freezing here in South Africa we can mine 24 7 and you know we very seldom get down to temperatures around the zero um, so you don't have to clear your plants and heat them with steam um, if you go and mine in the Arctic Circle, much like they do in Canada as well, you obviously need to clear things that so that your pipes don't freeze and the, the oil gets sticky and gluey and nothing works properly. But they certainly do produce, you know, lots of good diamonds. The, these are the more recent diamond mines. Um, some are pictures across in the Archangelsk um, area of northwest Russia. Um, th this is the Lom Nosova um, complex, two kimberlites next to each other. They're still being mined as, as open pits, quite um, extensive stripping of overburden. So that's also expensive, but you can see the gray um, portion of the kimberlite sort of down in the core. And then on the bottom left hand side is the uh, more recently developed grib kimberlite. And that kimberlite had about 80 meters of. Um, slushy you know wet wet and cold um, sand and debris that had to be stripped off the top so you can see these big um, flared open pit areas um, where you push back benches to make sure you can then eventually get into the kimberlite pipe down below and and moving all that dirt is is, is most expensive the interesting thing about the grip mine and and we're starting to see more of these big white diamonds also um, being recovered from from these Russian deposits in in the northwest of Russia. Okay, um, let's let's then just loop back um, to to Botswana and obviously um, southern Africa. So so we've talked about Russia, the world's largest producer, Botswana, um, little country, sort of the shining light of of Africa in many respects. It's been extremely well run. They've managed their resources exceptionally well um, and it's just north of South Africa's border um, and it has numerous kimberlites it has a cluster in the north here where we find Barapa and Karoi um, some some of you I'm sure have come across the Lakara Diamond Company it's a Canadian listed junior they um, produce some exceptional diamonds from a small kimberlite pipe um, called AK6 near Rapa. Rapa is the world's biggest active diamond mine and then joining down in the middle 
south of the country is the world's richest diamond mine and produces amazing stones. And, and you'll see straight away on, on this middle slide here are, are sort of three characters in the rough um, produced by the John Eng diamond mine. And, and straight away you'll notice that the exceptional colors, very, very clean white stones. And on the top right hand side is a big large diamond 236 carats out of um out of um it was in the rough um being cut and polished it was cut to a 101.73 dif that's um top color d um, internally flawless and the sale price of that was 26.7 million dollars so so not 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 bad so this this um is the country that is the second um, largest producer and it has some some or two exceptional diamond mines and then a couple of smaller ones, Karoe or, or the Lakara mine being being one of them. This is the, the Arapa open pit. It, it's still an open pit. Um, it's an exceptionally large kimberlite. The kimberlite itself was about one kilometer by 1.5 and, and has had a big crater full of fascinating fossils, plants and, and fish and, and so on, going back to about 80 million years. So it was a great treasure trove, not only from a diamond point of view, but also from a paleontological point of view. And you can see there on the right hand <coughs> top side is the, the satellite picture of, of, of the Arapa mine. The other good thing about diamond mines is that they, they don't have a particularly big footprint. And, and the other great thing, and we'll talk about it just briefly in the mining, section is that um, you don't use nasty chemicals or heat or, or um, acids um, in the whole diamond mining process. We really rely on physical processes to recover diamonds. And so we don't do aesthetically, you know, we make holes and, and ridges and dumps, um, but we don't use nasty chemicals um, to recover diamonds, which is a, a positive for the mining business. Um, the third largest producer is Canada, and it's a fascinating part of the world. The, the diamond, diamond deposits in, north, in the Northwest Territories, um, the, the Northwest part of Canada, were discovered in 1991. And um, they have been very successfully mined since then, but mostly small pipes, and we'll see some pictures shortly. Um, and the, these, these mines are almost in their waning stage and will be starting to close quite soon. So they've had a sort of life of mine of about, you know, 20, 20 odd years or, and a bit more, you know, compared to what we've seen in, in these amazing mega mines that you get in, for example, Botswana, which, um, so, so the Arapa mine was developed uh, or, or found in, in the late in 1960s and started in, in, um, in so Jining was started in 1981 and it's still going and it, and it will be going for, for a lot more. Okay, and, and here you can see on the right hand side just, you know, the problem with looking after your gear and equipment in, in these cold climates when it's typically minus 40 and your vehicles get frozen over. This is the Akati complex, two small kimberlite um, um, pipes, um, all, almost mined out by now, but um, so, so those, that, that's the Akati complex you'll hear about if you look at, uh, look at the literature. And then the other um, producer has been Divac. Divac um, this, this Akati was originally owned by, by BHP, and on the other hand, the Diavec mines, again, a number of small pipes, as we see there on the right, mined by Rio Tinto, developed by Rio Tinto. Um, I, I don't know how many people know or have been to Canada. Canada in the summer is just one big lake, particularly in northern Canada, because there's this tremendous amount of water on the old flattened land surface, flattened by glaciers. And so when they built these mines, um, bearing in mind the, the, you know, the amount of water in the summer, they had to build a, a bund wall around the, the actual deposits to ensure that they didn't get flooded in, in the summer period. In, in fact, it's much easier to work in Canada in the winter because everything's frozen. And we'll see one of the, the benefits of the big freeze you know, and their long winters. So, so those are the dieback mines, very small and also on, on their way out in terms of, of production. 
this this is a winter scene and it's it's sorry it's um it's a classic you can see that um you know the thousands of lakes if you look at the the sort of white patches there amongst the trees are all um lakes which are now frozen over and there's the winter ice road you can see through the middle of this slide on the left which is the road that services those mines in the far northwest um, so Yellowknife, which is the main sort of town and, and center of supply, um, is, is about 350 kilometers south of, of the actual mines, and they use this winter road. So come the winter and everything freezes over, they build roads across the, 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 the lakes, and they actually you know, help make those roads by pouring lots of water across um, portions where they need to thicken them up. And then you can run big um, pantechnicans with, with your gear and fuel supplies and resupplies that you need at the mine. Occasionally, you have this um, um, catastrophe as on the bottom right-hand side where, where particularly in the, in the sort of early spring or, or the, the autumn when the, when the road surface or the, or the lakes are not quite properly frozen, you may occasionally lose a vehicle through the through the, the, the broken road or the, the road that wasn't quite strong enough and you have to then go and fish it out. Okay, just quickly on secondary or alluvial deposits, I'm now going back to an earlier slide where we found um, um, the, the, um, the, 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 um, the, the kimberlites were being stripped off and weathered off and those diamonds were transported down big rivers as we have in South Africa or as we see in you know Central Africa, West Africa, and we have seen in Russia and Brazil. So, so and 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 again, just to make a point here, um, to to show you the difference between kimberlite um, production and and really exceptional um, alluvial production. If you look at the two pictures on the right hand side, at the bottom is a layout um, by Petra. Petra Diamonds, um, whose most of their assets are in South Africa. They took over old De Beers mines and Madui in Tanzania. And their, their bottom right is a very typical layout, apologies, of, of kimberlite mine production compared to, then uh, I showed you this picture in different format previously, production from Alex Core. And again, that's their layout where you hardly see a, a black or, or dirty stone. So it just highlights the difference between Kimberlite production, where all of this dark board material and, and black um, cruddy material will get broken down or attritioned in the, in the transport process, and you end up with that lovely stuff on the top right there. Okay, here in South Africa, and this is sort of a pet hobby of mine, we have exceptional alluvial deposits, very low grade, um, but very high quality diamonds down through, through the Vaal River in the middle of the country. So there's Johannesburg. Um, and and the, there's an ancient river, the Vaal River, which goes all the way down to to just um, beyond Kimberley and Prisca, joins up with the Orange River coming out of the Sutu, and then that river over a thousand odd kilometers makes its way all the way to our west coast, where we have the world's biggest diamond placer, and and that placer has been mined very extensively as well. So I'm going to quickly show you some pictures. Um, top right hand corner is the the concession structure of the diamond or marine diamond deposits in, in, in the South African waters. And then we'll also look at a few pictures in Namibia. So, so this, is, this is sort of um, some historical shots almost of, of how these small alluvial deposits or, or and big alluvial deposits were originally mined almost by pick and shovel and very simple um, rotary pans to recover or separate the heavy from the light material. And there in the background, and this, is, this, this was taken back in the um, early 2000s, the gentleman is actually sorting diamonds from his concentrate under that, um, that structure that you see there. Um, so, so a little bit of that's still happening, but the operations have got much bigger, but um, we still have a, a very active um, small alluvial diamond sector in South Africa. And, and these are some of the exceptional stones. The, these were stones from a company that I was involved with. So they all real and what well, they all real and exceptional diamonds and, and not not unlike many of the sort of large stones that you, you've seen come out of the old Brazil deposits and, and back in India. 
Um, right, so, so that, that covers the diamond side of it. Let's just quickly go and look at how we explore, explore for diamonds. And the point I want to part, part, you know, point out again, and it's important for, for us rough producers, so to speak, is that we haven't seen a major discovery or discovery of consequence since 91, 92, when the Canadian deposits at Akati and Diavik were discovered in the Northwest Territory through some really classic exploration work. Um, Rio Tinto, I did mention, discovered the Bunda lamp rights in 2004, but polit excuse me, politics and bureaucracy will, will probably, you know, stifle that development to maybe develop one day. The other point in terms of statistics or success of diamond exploration, it really is a case of high risk, high reward. A, a, a top quality diamond mine like your name can be an absolute um, real you know breadwinner or, or or jewel box um but it requires deep pockets typically to to get there so so if we go and look at the statistics that exist um we have about eight thousand odd known kimberlites lamprites and what we call related rocks um the, the, the percentage of those rocks which have measurable diamonds so if we took a big sample threw it in acid like hydrofluoric acid or we put it through a, a processing plant we get about 900 of those those primary rocks which actually yield some diamonds but down below you'll see there the total total primary mines and projects have only been about 102 it might be 105 or 110 but it's still very small it's only about one percent of the total and in terms of world-class tier one diamond mines, and I'm happy to share all this data with interested people, um, there have only been about 36 real world-class diamond mines. And, um, and that just tells you that this, you know, it's long odds and you need um, deep, um, deep pockets and a big checkbook to go and find these deposits. And, and that's one of the things that makes this whole business quite unique and rare. Okay, so, so the methodologies, um, they're, they're, they're a whole variety. Typically, um, in, in diamond um, exploration today, we will sort of choose a part of the world or part of a continent that looks prospective, and then we'll go and throw the geological book at it. We'll use structural geology and various other techniques to see if we think it's worth pursuing. And from there, um, the, the techniques that we still use most of mostly today would be what we call stream and soil sediment sampling, or, or we go looking for the pathfinders or the indicator minerals that come out of these um, that, that are weathered out of the kimberlites. And if we find those indicator minerals and we think a, a kimberlite, and I'm talking exclusively kimberlites or lamprites, are, is going to be prospective then we have a whole series of processes that we then go through um, to test that kimberlite intrusion, whether, whether and, and, and those vary from mini bulk sampling to, to big um, bulk sampling where we take hundreds and thousands of tons out of the, out of the kimberlite or the lamprite. And we go through a whole series of, of, of processes. We also have some quite powerful tools today, things like microdiamond analysis. We can put kimberlite samples into um, hydrofluoric acid or, or we use other processes as well. Hydrofluoric is dangerous, so, so we can do other processes to get the same effect. And we look for the very fine diamonds and we can use that as a predictive tool. But at the end of the day, if we're going to really evaluate a deposit, we still almost need to sort of um, do a trial mining exercise and end up with something like 10 million carats, which will give us the run of mine price and tell us whether something is going to be economic or not. And this, this I won't bore you with, but there's lots of it in the literature. This, is, this here is a typical sort of process um, flow sheet on the right hand side and, and the techniques that we, we use. Um, and again, on the left hand side of that slide are, are again, the descriptions of, of the processes. When, when we go to, to the field and we think we've now found something, um, this is in Brazil, for example, where there was a kimberlite that had been discovered quite some years ago now. And they were then looking for or looking to recover these what we call pathfinder or indicator minerals. So, so in this case, it's lots of garnets coming out of 
out of this kimberlite. So this now is is the kimberlite. We we've got into a kimberlite. We've stripped off the 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 cover, the red sand, and we've taken a, a sample of the kimberlitic material. We've screened it or concentrated, and you'll see this eye in in the sample here is what we will scoop up and we will take these minerals and analyze them and evaluate them to see if that kimberlite might have diamonds yeah here in this this um slide top right hand side are these what we call pathfinder minerals or, or indicators you can actually see again the red garnets there's some chrome diopside a pyroxene, there's probably some ilmenite and, and also black spinel in here. So these are the typical indicator minerals. And, it, and we would then um, have separated these from the rocks. We will um, take these minerals and put them into, into a resin and we will then analyze the, the actual composition of these minerals that have now come out of this so-called source rock or potential diamondiferous kimberlite. And again, we have a whole series of tools. If we do uh, microprobe analyses of, for example, the garnets, these red minerals, which are probably two to three millimeters in size here, you'll see, for example, we can do a very simple plot of garnets from a known diamondiferous kimberlites. Here, here we've plotted the chrome oxide CR203 versus the calcium composition of those red garnets. And, and if we take localities such as New Elands, which is a diamondiferous pipe, you'll see it has a very distinct pattern of, of garnet chemistry, as we call it. And there are a lot of garnets which are characterized by high chrome, but low calcium. On the other hand, if we go and look at a, a kimberlite pipe, which, which has no no diamonds or, or very few diamonds. This is Batty. It's a pipe in Canada on the on the bit middle um, part of this the slide. And if you look at it, look at that um, plot. It's very distinct and different from the left hand plot at, at New Zealand. So Batty, for example, only has one garnet that plots in the what we call low calcium, high chrome field. And, and those are the sort of tools that we are able to use in, in diamond prospecting. The other methods, of course, are geophysics. And geophysics, um, particularly airborne or ground magnetics, um, kimberlites, provided they in a quiet background, will show magnetic signatures. And, and this left-hand slide here shows um, kimberlites, small kimberlites from the Nunavut um, locality in, in Baff Baffin Island in the, in the northwest part of Canada. And you'll see lots of the lots of little um, red, um, what we call anomalies that stick out and the geophysicists obviously analyze all this data, which is collected from an aircraft. So you can do it quite quickly. And then you can locate these, these kimberlite pipes or kimberlite anomalies. Not all of them might be actual proper kimberlite pipes, but eventually you've got to get on the ground and go drill and sample them. So, so when you get into a known kimberlite area or kimberlite cluster, geophysics can be used very successfully to then find other pipes in an area that you've now got into. And, and, and that's another powerful exploration method. Okay, just um, starting to wind down. If we come to the actual diamond mining processes, I mentioned, for example, that you know diamond mining is quite clean. We can call it that. And typically, and, and I'm talking again here about kimberlite pipes. This is again the Akati kimberlites. We saw a picture of this earlier um, the, in the frozen wastes of, of northwest Canada. And, and, and so you will start as an open pit. And, and on the right-hand side is, is a more sunnier spot in the world. This is the Letseng diamond mine. It's the world's highest diamond mine in the middle of Lesotho. This is the open pit at Letseng. Letseng produces lots of those really high quality white stones. Not very many, but, but lovely stones. So, so typically you will start with an open pit. And when that open pit gets too deep and, and it starts to become economic, uneconomic, you then have to make a decision to actually go and develop an underground mine. And typically, you know, the, the, the production from an open pit is going to be at least twice um, that of, of an underground mine. So in, in, in all of these um, models and statistics that we've looked at too, 
part of the reason we're seeing a decline in the world production of diamonds at mo is that most of the ore bodies, there's no new, new ore bodies, most of the ore bodies have now gone underground. And when you go underground, your, your production falls off. And, and in many cases, it can be sort of half of the open pit production. And you then have to go developing at great cost um, declines and, and drop downs and conveyor belts to actually move the ore from underground. Okay, this is just um, a quick snapshot of the, the Kimberley mines also coming to the end of their lives. And, and you can see here, this just shows quite nicely the, the originally open pits. And then there were a whole series of typically what we call sub-level caving and, and, and block caving. Um, and, and again, if you look at all of these Kimberlite mines in, in and around Kimberley, there's not very much ore that's left to be mined. And the areas that are, sorry, still being mined are the, the brown, sort of brown areas. So, so those mines in Kimberley are also coming to the end of their lives. This is what we call a sub-level caving. This is just the, the methodology where you've gone from open pit, you now go underground, you, you cut slices through, through the Kimberlite pipe. Um, the, the one good thing about these pipes is they're constrained, you know, they're very easy to de delineate. And, and you cut and you basically pull the, pull the ore down on to yourself and you go through progressive deeper and deeper cuts and you drill up you do blasting and then that that whole process just keeps re repeating itself as you go down so that's sub-level caving it's quite expensive because you need lots of people and, and lots of equipment um but it's a it's a quick and 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 relatively um successful way of of underground mining for kimberlite pipes the other technique that that we use um successfully in in um, kimberlite pipe mining is what we call block caving so block caving is is a very um, initially capital intensive process you, you 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 basically go from an area that you were mining for example in these kimberlite uh, kimberly mines they would have gone from in this middle um, section middle say the 760 meter level and then you'll see there they went to the 825 meter level so so you go much lower down and you undercut so you you cut a slice through through the carrot or the pipe and you start drawing that material down again into a whole series of, of scraper drifts um, and and that's what we call block caving it, expensive up front it typically will take you two to three years to initiate a block cave because you want this process to basically mine itself but once that block cave is, is on the go, you can pull and progressively mine the whole carrot down um, on, onto yourself, right? Let's just move on to, to the big um, um, deposits, the, the old beaches of the western part of Namibia, um, southwest Namibia and, 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 and South Africa. Um, we had these, this mega placid deposit and that has been mined through strip mining along, along our coast. And we are also now seeing offshore deep water mining. So this is the the ancient beach deposits of southwest, um, sorry, yeah, southwest Namibia, and that's that material is now almost complete. Um, and they have tried methods like this to to mine um, the the sort of uh, midwater areas from the beach with jack up rigs. Um, and then the, the, the real technology today is in these massive um, mining vessels, which can go and mine at, at 120 meters of, of sea level. So, so here, for example, is two of De Beers' big um, marine mining vessels. These are vessels here we see in Cape Town Harbor. They were there for refitting and supply. And then they go back up the west coast to Namibian waters to mine at 120 meters of, of depth and recover these exceptional high quality gems off, off the seabed. Okay, ore processing and treatment. Um, again, the, the whole recovery of, of diamonds has become very sophisticated. Um, the technology works like, like a bomb. We have used um, technology coming out of the 
the um, trash recycling business um, to, to recover diamonds. Diamonds are obviously very rare, and we, we're looking to recover very few particles out of lots of crushed up material. So I won't go to this, I won't go into this at great length, but um, the technology for um, extracting um, ore once you've got the ore and then um, crushing the ore is, is, is very sophisticated. We try and prevent the breakage of diamonds. We then screen to remove the oversize and underside. We prepare the material through scrubbing to remove fines and, and muddy material. And then we ha have a whole lot of techniques, um, be it X-rays or X-ray tomography, where we can separate diamond from, from the, the surrounding material. All of these plants are, are very sophisticated and hands-off, containerized. Obviously, shrinkage is a problem in, in any of these high-value ores. And so we try and prevent the, the um, people getting hands into the system. Um, th this here is the Lakara diamond mine. Just to finish off, it's just a snapshot that shows a whole process. It's a classic um, junior diamond mining operation in Botswana. And they're using some very sophisticated technology. And that's the reason they, they see, you know, almost on a monthly or couple, every couple of months, you see big diamonds being recovered from the Lakara mine, AK6 in Botswana. The classic was in 2015, where they recovered three big stones, 1,111, an 804, and a 374 carat stone um, within sort of a couple of hours, probably a, a, a one big stone that had, that had been broken either in the emplacement or maybe in the actual mining process. Okay, and there my, my conclusions. Um, hopefully I haven't taken up too much of your time. But just to, to, to finish off, um, the diamond business is, is at a fascinating stage. As I said, we haven't seen a, a major discovery um, since the 1990s. And um, we're now seeing the advent of, of synthetic diamonds. Um, but but the, the, the industry goes on. And, and we've um, also, you know, we've, we've had the pandemic, um, but this business has been through lots of other challenges in its 2000 years. So it's an old and resilient industry. Um, and hopefully all the young people on this course, um, there'll be some of you that, you know, make a difference in the different in, in, in the future. We need young geologists to, to continue with new exploration. Um, and obviously the business will change. It's, it's not a particularly big business, but it's really a great fun business and, and hopefully this presentation will give you some background. You also, as I said, welcome to contact me anytime so we can um, follow up on some of your questions. And there again, on the top right hand side, one of these amazing blue diamonds that came from the premier Cullinan diamond mine in, in South Africa and sold for some fairly substantial prices. Thank you, Kim, and thanks to everyone else.